Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a new rescue package for farmers and ranchers, but it doesn't cover everyone. We hear from Sonny Purdue, why not? And an inside look at the meat supply chain, Purdue says it's more about demand than anything else. Plus, last month, worried about panic, Americans bought guns at a record pace. We talked to an expert about being safe with all that firepower. And in our feature, think of it as a victory garden on steroids. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. And as the nation continues to talk about opening up, we hope that you're coping as well as possible. A lot to tell you about, including the late breaking release of a new farm rescue package by Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue. In a conference call just days ago, Purdue told us the initial details of that package totaling $19 billion. It includes $16 billion in direct payments to farmers and ranchers and another $3 billion to buy meat, dairy and produce from them and redistribute it to food banks and faith-based organizations. It does not include money for those who grow corn for the ethanol industry, Purdue saying that there are budgetary considerations. Frankly, at this point, there's just not enough money to go around. The demand from all the sectors was even more than we could accommodate at this time. Uh, and the macro energy issue is certainly affecting uh, all sectors of energy. So it's just more than we could do from the USDA perspective at this time. Producers will be paid 85% of their price losses from January 1st through April 15th and 30% of their expected losses for the next two quarters. The USDA expects to get payments to producers by early June. There's a cap of $125,000 per commodity. There is still a lot of worry about the economy, especially the supply chain. Between those out of work, those who are quarantined by the virus, and the inexhaustible demand of consumers, producers remain concerned. Josh Bittner has the story. The shuttering of meatpacking facilities across the country due to cases of COVID-19 diagnosed among hundreds of workers, some fatal, have led to livestock supply chain warnings. Tyson Foods Columbus Junction, Iowa plant and Smithfield Sioux Falls, South Dakota facility, among the higher profile closures in recent weeks, on their own represent 2 and 5 percent respectively of the nation's hog slaughtering capacity. It hasn't been in any farm animals uh, anywhere in the world that we're aware of. Dr. Jim Roth researches infectious diseases and food security at Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. He says international studies have purposely tried to infect pigs to no avail. While Roth zeroes in on bats as coronavirus zoonotic source from Chinese wet markets, people for the ethical treatment of animals protested on the heels of Tyson's Columbus Junction stoppage, citing past deadly disease jumps from swine to people. But Roth says the current threat to the viability of U.S. animal-based food sources is workers. It's very difficult to social distance in any assembly line operation because you have assigned spots where you have to work and next to other people. Even with increased safety measures in place, processors have continued to cease operations for days, weeks, or indefinitely. Roth adds workforce demographics can be another wrinkle. Immigration laws have limited the number of workers available. And then as workers get sick, we're really coming to appreciate how important they are and will continue to be. It's been a struggle to get enough workers, especially in, in the rural areas where some of these packing facilities are located. Mike Poston is president of the Iowa Pork Producers Association. His family operation near Walcott brings 28,000 pigs to market annually. That is one of my concerns, is that, is that this, this workforce is being stigmatized to some degree because of, of this um, issue that we've had with, with positive workers at some of the packing facilities. There's a reason why they're there and why they're working. Pauschen sees essential workers like farmhands and meat packers, along with transportation and grocery laborers, on the front lines of the pandemic. 
He cautions that their perils ripple across the food system. I want to be clear. The bare store shelves that you may see in some cities in the country are a demand issue, not a supply issue. This week, USDA sought to quell concerns over plant closures and milk dumping with plans to seek $16 billion in direct payments for producers and another $2 billion to buy up excess farm products for food banks. We've got it marked out, you know, for the six-foot distance just to stay in compliance with everything. Um, we are opening up our online bidding for anybody that wants to view online, and you can bid online. Corey Rosenboom has adapted his Knoxville, Iowa cattle sale barn to a new reality. A recent study by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association predicted COVID-19 would cause over $8 billion in losses for domestic cow-calf producers in coming years without government assistance. We've never dealt with anything like this before. But Rosenboom's business partner, Joe Wright, claims the industry knows a thing or two about persevering in the face of insurmountable odds. I'd say a cattleman is pretty resilient, you know, for what we've went through in the last 20 years. We're going to get back to something that will be near normal, but this is hit, and it's going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with, I think, from here on out. A different kind of story now. According to the FBI, Americans bought guns at a record pace last month. Out of the top 10 days ever in the history of the background check system, five of them in a row were in mid-March of this year. Nearly four million background checks were done overall, the most ever in one month. So with our audience in mind and with the help of an expert trainer and my wife Brenda, here's some food for thought on gun safety. The first Saturday in March, we sold more, almost every gun we had in the store. People were coming in and panic buying. Uh, I want a gun. They didn't say what kind or anything. I just, I want a gun. Galo Grosinski runs Gunco in Starkville, Mississippi. After what happened in March, he knows firsthand there are a lot more guns on the streets. I felt like getting a gun was a smart thing to do in the times that we're in. Like a lot of folks right now, my wife Brenda, who's disabled, was feeling nervous. So what we have is a bunch of people running around with handguns and don't know the first thing about them. But she wanted to do things right, so we went to see this man. Okay, Brenda, most gunfights are from 9 to 15 feet. Steve Carter is a certified defensive handgun instructor, and his first thought is that all those new gun owners get some training. If anyone's buying a gun for the purpose of defending themselves, they need to get some professional training. Because handguns in and of themselves are not dangerous, but if they're in the hands of someone that's not trained, they're more likely to injure themselves or their family than they are to defend themselves. Steve demonstrates what he calls a double tap. And then it's Brenda's turn. What I want you to do is look right across the top of the barrel and slowly but steadily squeeze the rounds off, okay? okay. Now go ahead. gun is empty, let me have the gun. Steve puts Brenda through a rigorous training session. Turns out she's pretty good. Brenda, this is good defensive handgun shooting. You don't need to shoot any better than that in your whole life. You have stopped your enemy. This fight is over. Awesome. Awesome. Now that I've been through some training, I feel like I could use the gun and feel comfortable with it. I hope I never have to use it. But if I did, I feel good about it. God, you just don't miss. <laughs> <laughs> You're awesome. What encouragement. By the way, to reach Steve Carter, just Google Steve Carter Defensive Handgun Instructor. He is quite an expert. On the rosier side of things, pun intended, it's getting to be that time of year to plant roses. Gary Bachman says there are some varieties that almost thrive on neglect. That's how easy they are to grow. Here's Gary. Many homeowners are interested in roses, but may think that they're very labor intensive. Let me show you a couple of options for easy care landscape roses that grow well in containers. Most gardeners have heard of Knockout Roses, a 2006 Mississippi Medallion winner. A newer selection is Double Knockout that features shiny fire engine red blooms from early summer and into the fall season, most of which are fully double with some semi-double. 
Another great choice are the Drift Roses, also a Mississippi Medallion winner in 2016. This rose series, and there are 10 selections, has a mounding and spreading growth habit that will eventually grow to three feet tall and four feet wide. Coral Drift has bright and vibrant coral orange flowers. Popcorn Drift continuously produces flowers that start a soft buttery yellow and fades to a creamy white. Drift Roses will rebloom every five to six weeks regardless of deadheading. One more option are the Sunblaze Miniature Rose varieties. These compact roses will bloom from early summer and well into autumn. They look spectacular in containers. There are 12 varieties. Sunblaze Rainbow is one of my personal favorites and the blooms are a stunning orange red when fully open. My other favorite is Sunblaze Yellow Miniature Rose. This selection features bright sunshine yellow flowers that transition to a creamy color. You can electrify your landscape by planting these beautiful shrub roses. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, imagine a farm that's only 400 square feet, uses only eight gallons of water a day, grows a variety of crops without the sun, with a crop cycle from seed to harvest in eight weeks. Can you actually make a living this way? Yes, you can, and we'll meet an urban farmer harvesting his way into the hearts of his customers. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Time for the markets now with Zach Ashmore. Zach? Thanks, Mike. Markets took a small dive last week based on current COVID-19 instability, as if you needed a reminder. Along with its fallout, let's take a look. Mostly red. The biggest drop comes from wheat, down $22.75. Experts say the reason? Stockpiling of grains during the outbreak start means now they're in less demand. The biggest gain? Lumber up $19.16, continuing a three-week streak. Last week on Easter Sunday, Mississippi was swept by several tornadoes, hitting the poultry industry hard. MSU Extension poultry professor Tom Tabler tells us that the situation is dire, but not unrecoverable. So there's, there's multiple companies that grow birds in the state that have multiple complexes throughout the state. By far the hardest hit was the Sanderson Farms complex at Collins. 
the the most recent figures that I have is roughly 200,000 birds lost in that one complex. Again, that number will change. Now, 200,000 birds is a you know is a devastating number of chickens to lose, especially for the growers that are involved that lost houses, that lost birds, for the companies that own those birds. For the poultry industry in Mississippi as a whole, 200,000 head is a bunch of chickens. 200,000 head on a national level is a fairly small number of chickens. I, I say that just so that people do not think they're going to have to run out to the store and try to buy up all the chicken because the price is going to go up. The price should not go up. We need to look at it from two different ways. We need to look at it from the standpoint of, of how will this affect the general population and the meat supply that we have in this state, but we also need to look at it from the standpoint of, of how devastating of a loss this is to growers, to companies, to the poultry industry within the state of Mississippi. We're not on an island. There's bunches of other states besides Mississippi that have a huge poultry industry. It's a big deal for us right here because it does affect our farmers, our companies that are in this state, the Extension Service is very aware of that. My bosses, myself, all the county agents in counties where storms went through, you know, we're available to those folks to help. I've reached out to all of the, the complex managers in the state that were affected. I've reached out to the county agents in those counties that were affected to let them know, you know, I'm here, I can help you, just tell me what you need, and I'm willing to do that. Growers, for the most part, just need somebody to talk to, to listen to them, and then give them some direction, you know, to where they can get some help, whether it's financial help, whether it's from the federal government, whether it's who to talk to with their lender, how to approach things in a step-by-step -step process. An ongoing issue affecting the markets, animal growers versus packers, and who deserves what part of the meat industry's financial pie. Mike spoke with MSU Extension economist Josh Maples to get his thoughts. You know, there are a number of groups that represent producers all around the country. Many of them are saying the same thing. Not all of the groups are the same size or have the same power, but they are expressing big time concern that producers are getting less of the retail dollar than the packers are. What, what can you say about that? Yes, Mike, that is, that, that is something that's, that comes up frequently, right? I mean, we, we saw it last year with the, the Tyson beef packing fire, uh, uh, beef packing plant fire. And I think my response right now is if, you know, the way the markets are currently reacting to this at all levels uh, really is not unusual compared to how you would expect them to react. And again, it goes back to that uncertainty piece. You know, when you're in an environment of such uncertain consumer demand, um, that kind of typically leads to incredible volatility and some, and some depressed prices. Now, with particular respect to uh, box beef cutout values and, and, and cattle prices, you know, the, the big the big stir is that box beef cutout was going up last week quickly and cattle prices weren't immediately following. But, you know, if we kind of think about the way that cattle move through the system, you know, uh, and grocers typically buy, you know, weeks in advance. They, they lock in some kind of price weeks in advance. So I think what we're really seeing is some logistical issues uh, as far as getting things shifted from food service over to, to grocery stores. Uh, and quite frankly, in a time like this, as uncertain as, as things are, you know, we really shouldn't expect markets to, 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 to move as quickly as as they might otherwise in terms of making sure everything down the chain it, it, it follows it directly. So I think it's a timing issue. Uh, I don't think markets are broken. I've heard that question a lot. Uh, I, I don't think we're in a world where the markets are totally broken. I do think we're in a world where the uncertainty is is really hammering uh, how, quickly, how, how quickly prices can respond and how they should respond. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Next week, we're having a really good feature show, but I'll be back the week after with more. Mike? If you live in the big city and you're not a farmer, but you'd like to be someday, you'll get a kick out of this. A creative New Yorker got the idea to start a nonprofit that teaches how to raise high margin veggies in those containers you see on ships. Believe it or not, it's working. Here's Peter Tubbs.
So there's no doubt, and I hope that during the course of the year here, we will definitely inspire a number of these people to embark on a lifelong journey to be farmers. The here is the Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. On the edge of the parking lot of a former Pfizer pharmaceutical plant sit 10 shipping containers. Each has been converted for growing hydroponic vegetables under LED lighting. 10 laboratories for aspiring agricultural entrepreneurs growing food that is unique in product and location. The brainchild of Tobias Peggs, Square Roots is a nonprofit that aims to bring fresh produce to urban consumers by training farmers to build businesses in their communities. Each container has the production capacity of two acres of land and promises a better quality product by maintaining a consistent environment. And obviously people are increasingly moving to the city, right? So we got to figure out how, how to farm um, in those urban areas, whether that's indoors in containers or whether that's outdoors, um, you know, in, in more sort of urban gardens or greenhouses, you know, whatever it is, the more food that's being grown close to the city, the more access that people have got to local food, the better. Square Roots mentors spend a year teaching the how-to of business and hydroponic agriculture to classes of recruits who dream of becoming urban farmers. Few of the entrepreneurs arrive with an agricultural background, so the learning curve can be steep. Farmer Josh Alaber spent his year learning to grow basil and build an audience for his crops. I spent the first two to three months walking around from restaurant to restaurant in Manhattan meeting chefs learning about what they value, learning about how I can improve my crops, and becoming a better farmer. So the, the startup time was really hard, but it worked because the product that we grow is so fresh, and you say, I harvested this today, they taste it and they say, I've never tasted basil like this. Freshness is only one of the selling points for the Square Roots farmer. Growing crops unavailable in the wholesale and retail supply chain can help close a sale. A lot of these chefs have been in the culinary industry 30 to 40 years. And as a brand new farmer, because I'm growing in a really unique environment where I can grow really unique crops, I can bring them things that they've never tried before. And the taste is, speaks for itself um, because it's growing in the exact environment that it wants. The taste drives a solid price for produce. While a salad mix starts at $10 per pound, rare varieties of basil command $30 per pound at local restaurants. Each farmer develops a customer mix of restaurants and food retailers who buy in bulk and individuals who purchase salad greens through a subscription model. The greens are hand-picked and delivered up to three times a week. So we feel that the, the, the way the product is priced today is definitely mass market, but every single day we work to um, you know, improve the technology, make the system more efficient, that will allow us ultimately to bring down that price and ultimately uh, fulfill the mission that the company has, which is to bring real food to everyone. The physical constraints of a square roots container farm limit the types of crops grown by each farmer to just the small and valuable. Salad greens, kales, sorrel, Swiss chard, and herbs are best suited to the vertical towers inside the farms. Crops grow quickly under the red and blue LED lighting optimized for plant growth. A footprint of only 400 square feet allows a farm to squeeze into tight urban environments and shorten the literal distance from farm to plate. Under LED lighting, some crops go from seed to harvest in as little as eight weeks. The container farm has operating costs of roughly $1,000 per month, but requires only eight gallons of water per day. Once a crop rotation is developed, harvesting can happen each week, year round. So what we're able to do is create unique environments for crops in very urban settings. Um, particularly today we're in bed -Stuy. I personally grow crops that you wouldn't typically be able to find in a local environment. The ability to simulate varied environments is another advantage of growing crops inside a container. If a variety of basil prefers a specific temperature, humidity, or altitude, the environmental controls within a square roots farm can be set to mimic ideal growing conditions. While the ability to grow a high volume of quality produce in a small amount of urban space has been confirmed, price is the next frontier. 
for urban container farming to scale up and become affordable for a neighborhood, the cost per pound will have to decline. The fact that we're able to compete now tells us that as we really increase production and bring the cost down, we're going to be able to produce food at a much, much more competitive cost that's better quality than is already existing in the marketplace. Until then, the farm incubator will continue to experiment with a food supply chain that can be measured in yards rather than miles. At the end of the day, I think what the consumer wants is food that they can trust and that tastes really amazing. And if you know your farmer, you trust the food. Once you taste that food, you're won over. Food you can trust in an easy to manage supply chain. Well, next week on the show, we've got a hot story for you. We're at the Rio Grande River, where in that part of the country, they grow a crop that's been on plates longer than apple pie has been American. Hatch, New Mexico is the chili pepper capital of the world. There's even a Chili Pepper Institute for an industry worth almost half a billion dollars a year. There's more to that story though. Tune in to find out what it is next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed the story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us, as always, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy.